today's session is going to start off with a quick introduction of what the session is and what the goals are. And then we're, we'll have the panelists introduce themselves. Um, and uh, then we'll get into some questions from the moderators, which is Aaron, Ifan, and me. And, and then we'll uh, dive into the slider questions and um, as well as in-person questions. So we have a pretty, pretty packed uh, for COVID uh, meeting, <laughs> meeting room here. There's about uh, 11 of us. So we might get some uh, in-person questions as well. Um, and then we'll leave a few minutes so that the panelists can add any closing um, thoughts or uh, comments they wanted to add that they didn't, weren't able to get to. Um, and then I also want to mention that we have, uh, did you mention that we have Valerie with us today and she'll be um, filling in when there's confusion about NCAR specific um, policies um, and so she'll, she'll be there to support us in that way. Um, and then next slide, please. So for today, we're going to be talking about how you could find relevant uh, proposal calls for um, an NSF and um, NOAA. Those are the two agencies represented here today by our panelists. And we'll talk about how uh, they'll talk about how we can respond to those proposal calls. Um, and then we'll be um, we'll also be diving into what are the specific requirements for different programs. And then maybe get into the nitty gritty of how you could um, possibly navigate multiple funders or partial funding or sending a proposal to mul multiple calls. So, and these these will really be based on what questions you guys have. So it's not set in stone. It's kind of like we want to make sure that we get to the questions that you have about um, submitting proposals to different agencies. Um, so we can get started. And I'll have. Um, Eric, um, Eric introduce himself and maybe talk a little bit about, about um, the program that he manages and uh, kind of what he knows, what he can tell us about it. So, Eric, uh, if you start. Okay, I, I'm going to talk for, for what, 10 minutes, something like that? Yeah. Um, okay. maybe 10 yes. minutes. yeah. Just let me know when, I'm, when I've gone too far. Um, Okay. I'm Dr. Weaver, um, and, and I want to thank Danielle and, and, and uh, the other organizers of this meeting for, for giving me a chance to, to participate in it. Um, I work at the National Science Foundation. I've been here for about a dozen years now, um, and I've spent the whole time in the climate and large-scale dynamics program. So this is a program that funds research on uh, climate, climate dynamics, uh, and also atmospheric circulation, and um, I guess uh, atmospheric circulation, including things that are kind of of the size of the synoptic scale to the global scale. So we have another program called Physical and Dynamic Meteorology, um, which funds research on what you would call mesoscale meteorology. So, you know, they would be covering things that are smaller than the size of you know, weather fronts and, and baroclinic eddies, uh, things smaller than, I guess, the deformation radius, if you want to use kind of, you know, some fancy terminology. Uh, and we also fund, um, we fund research on global warming. You know, I sometimes respond to queries about that from people like Senator Rand Paul. Um, we fund uh, a lot of work on El Nino, on climate variability. Uh, the North Atlantic Oscillation, if you've heard of that, Sudden Stratospheric Warmings, Stratospheric Dynamics is included in the program. Uh, and I could list other things as well, but I, I probably couldn't come up with a, an all-inclusive list without blowing the 10-minute limit. Um, as far as uh, kind of, you know, things that I would say um, just to kind of get the ball rolling, I mean, first of all, this is posed as uh, uh, well, okay, I could say more about myself. I mean, I've, 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 you know, got my PhD in atmospheric science. I actually have a PhD in meteorology, which is very rare these days. I think the year after I got my degree, the department changed its name to atmospheric and oceanic sciences, and I think a lot of departments did then as well. I mean, partly because meteorology is too much associated sort of with TV meteorology, but also because I think there was a desire um, to expand uh, the scope of programs and to recognize that, you know, there's more commonalities than differences between, you know, um, the atmosphere and the ocean in terms of fluid dynamics, 
uh, if you really want to understand the phenomena of, of, of the atmosphere, you have to look at the coupled problem. I think we were, you know, a lot of that is motivated by El Nino, for instance, where you really need to understand how the atmosphere talks to the ocean and vice versa. Um, so uh, that was in 1999. I did a postdoc at the University of Washington for a couple of years, uh, and then I was on faculty at the University of Wisconsin. Um, then I was there until 2008, and in 2009 I joined um, uh, the National Science Foundation. Um, uh, as far as uh, you know, things that I could say, uh, just just addressing this this particular um, um, audience. Um, first of all, this is posed as grant writing, and you know, to be clear, what I'm going to talk about is proposal writing. So for us, a grant is a legal instrument. It's a it's a contract that the government makes with usually with a university. Um, and so what you're going to be writing is a proposal, and that proposal goes for review. And if you're lucky, that proposal results in a grant. Um, typically, if you're at a university, you're not the one submitting the proposal. The proposal is submitted by uh, an institution rather than an individual. Um, and I would argue that that's, for the most part, a good thing, right? You're employed by a university, and then the university, and or, you know, I mean, I, you could imagine being, you know, you could be employed by NCAR, um, that institution uh, is going to submit that proposal. You work for them, so they take care of all of the sort of things that you would need as an employee, and things like figuring out how your health care works and so on and so forth. Um, you write the proposal and then they upload it. That's a good thing because that means that they have expertise in their sponsored research office as to how the process works. And the hope is that they will be able to guide you and provide a lot of useful information to you. Uh, if that's not the case at the place where you're at, uh, then we can help you with that. Um, you know, not every sponsored research, uh, sponsored research uh, offices are not sort of all equivalent. Um, different universities have different rules. We sort of allow that. Um, and so there's a lot of that that kind of doesn't come directly from the agency, but, but comes from the institution that, that employs you. Um, as far as the formalities of how to submit a proposal to the National Science Foundation, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because that's actually the part um, that's online. There is a proposal uh, and awards policies and procedures guide um, which says, you know, these are the sections of the proposal, this is the number, this is the page limit, you know, um, this is how long, how much space you have to, to put your biographical sketch. We call it a biographical sketch. I don't know why we call it that instead of a resume or a CV. Um, but all that information is online. We're happy to help you with that. But I think where I could be more helpful is to kind of, you know, just share with you a little bit my experience of, you know, having read a whole bunch of proposals and, you know, uh, uh, you know, talk a little bit about, you know, how things work in my program. Um, I do want to point out, though, that uh, a thing that you need to keep in mind about the National Science Foundation is that proposal, different programs are run differently. We're a very heterogeneous organization, and I think that to some extent that's motivated by the fact that we serve very different communities depending on which science, uh, you know, we're funding, uh, and the expectations of those communities and their needs and so on and so forth are very different. Um, some of these things, I think, are also simply historical. Uh, so I'll give you one example, um, and this is, this is, I think, very relevant because one of the questions that, that um, that, that I think, you know, comes up is, you know, what are the, um, you know, what are the, what are the deadlines, you know, um, for, for submitting proposals? Um, my program, Climate Large Scale Dynamics, does not actually have deadlines. You can submit a proposal whenever you want. Um, and that tends to be the norm in the section, the atmosphere section, which, which is my program, Climate Large Scale Dynamics, the Physical and Dynamic Meteorology Program, which does mesosteel meteorology, microphysics, a lot of things like that. They do lightning, for instance. Um, they, uh, uh, we have a paleoclimate program um, that's different. They actually do have a deadline. There's an atmospheric chemistry program that does not have a deadline. Um, you know, and and so that is allowed to have the, the, those those differences. You have to, you know, the only way to really deal with those differences is to go and look at the website for the individual program. Um, and and we could talk about that some more if you like. Um, and you know, the reason fundamentally why my program doesn't have deadlines is that when we receive proposals, we send them out for review. We go and ask people, please, 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 will you, will you review this proposal? Um, and you know, we rely on you know getting 
three, four, maybe five people to look at the proposal. They write, you know, we call them written reviews, but of course they're uploaded. We even call them, you know, mail-in reviews sometimes, but they're actually uploaded through, through, through uh, I guess, fastlane.nsf.gov is the website. Um, and, you know, because we're doing everything that way, we don't have the logistics of convening a panel which has to convene on a certain date. And so we don't want, you know, if, you're, if you've got a panel, you've got to put that stack of proposals in front of the panel at a given date. So you, you, you necessarily will want it, usually, I guess, not necessarily, you want a deadline for proposals to come in. Um, and so navigating that uh, is something to think about, you know, that, that the programs have, some programs have deadlines, some programs do not. Um, you know, and, and, and I think, you know, being aware of these heterogeneities and, and having a conversation about them, I, I think is quite important. Uh, maybe we can do a little bit of that today. Um, I guess other things to think about, um, you know, if you work at NSF, at, at, at NCAR, you would have to consult with Valerie about the rules for, you know, how NCAR staff can submit proposals. Uh, to NSF, and I don't know if I want to sort of go into that right now, just because I actually don't know how many of you um, are, are going to be working at, at, at NCAR, um, but, but that's a conversation to have. Um, and uh, uh, I guess, you know, one of the questions that I saw sort of posed was, you know, how to find opportunities uh, to submit proposals. So, you know, what I would recommend is go to the NSF website, um, you know, you can find programs, you can find the taxonomy of how we fund science. This is a geoscience directorate. It has a division for oceans, a division for atmosphere, a division for, you know, for solid earth, um, um, you know, uh, um, that, that kind of thing. I think it, there's a polar programs, uh, lots of polar programs as well. That kind of thing you can do sort of from the top down. Another way of doing it, which I, I might recommend is, Go to nsf.gov and you can search for existing awards. In fact, if you go to the advanced search sort of, um, you know, web page, you can search on keywords. So pick the favorite keywords that best describe what your research interests are and what you want to do. And you can easily generate a list of all of the proposals that have that keyword in their abstract or title. Um, and that might be a good starting point because then it may be that the kinds of things you want to work on are actually funded in different parts of NSF, you know, with slightly different sorts of, you know, requirements and and and, and research agendas and, and goals and so on and so forth. Uh, and so that would be my sort of recommendation is to, you know, and you could get other information from that kind of web search, which is things like, you know, well, on average, how big is the award size? You know, how many years is the period of performance? You know, information that's kind of practical, useful information. Um, so that that would be kind of I think my answer to that to that kind of how to find opportunities um, question. Uh, there's also a question here about deliverables and timelines. I mean, you know, I think it's important to recognize that NSF essentially was set up so that the government could fund academic research, um, and the expectation I think with academic research is that you know you take the money that you get to do academic research and use it um, to write papers, you know, to to, to publish to to, to to get research results uh, and publish them and present them at conferences and things like that. So typically the deliverables of an NSF award that we would fund um, really are supposed to look like your day job as an academic, you know, in a certain sense. And so that's publications and I'm emphasizing that. But of course, you know, we also have a mandate um, to, to sort of educate the next generation of scientists. So we'd be looking at you know, um, are there students going to be funded on this project? Are there postdocs that are going to sort of have their early career, you know, research experience working on this award? Um, and so that would be something to think about, you know, as you, uh, uh, you know, as, as you plan that, that um, you know, as you think about this, this, this proposal that you're going to write. Uh, you know, the, the timeline business, you know, if, if your goal is to do research and it's blue skies research where you don't really know the result ahead of time, they tend not to be milestones and deliverables in the way that there would be um, on a contract or something like that, where we're basically paying you to build a widget and we want to check to make sure that you're making good progress on building the widget. Um, you know, that that does happen. I mean, it's something we can talk about, but it's not really the norm, at least in my program. Um, and uh, as far as timelines, you know, one of the things that, um, you know, to think about there, most of the awards that we make are three-year awards. It's not a rule. You can ask for more years. You can ask for less years, too, although it's debatable, you know, whether that's the best strategy. Um, 
something to think about with timelines is that, you know, it's not uncommon that people don't finish the research as promised or spend all the money in three years. And it's actually very easy to get an extension for another year. Um, I think we have a lot of flexibility on that, you know, and it's something that, you know, to some extent you might want to take advantage of. For example, if there's a pandemic, you might find that you can't make progress the way you had hoped. Um, NSF is able to be pretty accommodating with that. You know, when we give you money, you know, we might give you all that money on day one of the um, period of performance. Um, you have five years to spend that money. You know, even if it's a three-year award, we could extend it for another couple of years. You can't keep the money forever. If you sit on it for too long, the Department of Treasury will come in and take it away from you. Um, but that Treasury Department limit generally exceeds the period of performance on the award. So it's something you, you know, that, that does come in handy. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in terms of specific requirements, um, you know, you may be aware that NSF uh, has... Um, two requirements. One is called intellectual merit and the other one is called broader impacts. Um, I think intellectual merit is reasonably well defined. You know, you make progress on disciplinary science that you're funded to do. Broader impacts is a very much more general um, category and, and we can talk about that. I could I could dig out the rules and, and, and read them to you. That's a, a long kind of list. Um, but broader impacts gets at the societal relevance of the work that you're doing. It gets at the educational activity that's going to be performed under that. Um, you know, these days I think there's a lot of emphasis on um, diversity and inclusion. You know, so things that you do that sort of, you know, uh, increase the sort of, you know, inclusiveness of, of, of the research world. I think are are very much uh, of interest to to NSF. Um, but I think it's a longer conversation, you know, what exactly do we, you know, what really are the sort of, um, you know, uh, um, expectations of NSF when it comes to broader impacts. And again, that's a thing where you do find differences from one program to another. Uh, and I do, again, you know, recommend if you go to the NSF award search and look at some abstracts, you can easily see, you know, what people are doing in terms of broader impacts. And it's actually kind of fun to read that stuff because... You, know, you can get very creative when it comes to you know activities that you would do you know under the mandate of of broader impacts. Um, so I I don't know if I've gone over my ten minutes, but I kind of think I must be getting pretty close. If I is uh, um, I'll ask Danielle. Is there anything else you'd like to comment on before me to comment on before I sort of um, give the floor to someone else? I think for now that that was really great, and I think you covered a really great overview of um, the program and um, NSF in general. So I think we'll hand it over to Ginny for now and um, have her introduce herself, and uh, then we can get into the questions. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, Danielle. I'm Ginny Sells. I'm from the Climate Program Office, and I manage a program called the Climate Observations and Monitoring Program, which focuses on increasing the use and value of NOAA's observations and other publicly available um, observations for climate monitoring and climate modeling, as well as climate-relevant societal applications. So the program is quite broad. Um, and it sits in the Earth System Science and Modeling Division in the Climate Program Office. And so also within the Earth System Science and Modeling Division, there are um, four or so other programs. And that includes programs that focus on atmospheric chemistry and climate, uh, the Modeling Analysis Predictions and Projections Program, the Earth Radiation Budget Program, which is new within the last few years, authorized by Congress, and the Climate Variability and Predictability Program. So each of those programs have their own focus areas, which um, are kind of described by their names and they're managed by different program managers, but I should be able to answer some questions um, on any of those programs. In addition to the Climate Program Office in NOAA, there are also other program offices like the Weather Program Office, which funds primarily the S2S work that you might be interested in. Um, I will not be able to answer questions about the weather program office because that's a separate office from CPO. But within CPO, um, I can probably answer your questions. So each of the programs have competitions that are advertised through a notice of funding opportunity. Um, and so our programs within the Earth System Science and Modeling Division 
um, generally follow the same rules because it's all going to be explained in that notice of funding opportunity. And so the proposals will have the same elements, they'll be on the same timeline. Um, one difference is that we retain uh, the um, possibility to, to review the applications differently. And so some programs may choose to only use external reviewers and not hold a panel. And so your proposal may be review, reviewed by three or four external reviewers. Some programs may choose to hold a panel. And so your proposal would be reviewed by a, a panel. And then some um, programs may choose to do a hybrid. And so they can use external reviewers as well as a, a panel. And um, in addition, for our programs, we have a two-stage review panel. So the first thing your proposal does is it goes through a scientific and technical merit review where it's reviewed for its scientific and technical merit. Um, the, the budget is reviewed as well as the qualifications of the applicant. Proposals that score above 3.0 and meet a certain threshold move on to a stage two relevance panel. And in that panel, that is a separate set of panelists. Um, that is a panel that is not external reviewers. And those panelists review the proposal for its relevance to NOAA. And that is even more defined in the notice of funding opportunity. And so again, all of this is explained in the notice of funding opportunity. But what goes into to relevance to NOAA includes your data management plan as well as your diversity inclusion diversity and inclusion statement um, so that's kind of the review process of the program and how all of the programs follow on um, the same review process let's see oh a little about me um, my uh, phd is in earth system science um, but i consider myself a polar oceanographer which i don't focus on um, anymore focus more on uh, the many different observations that NOAA has after my phd i um, jumped straight into a senior program associate role the, um, at, with aaas the american association for the advancement of science and worked more in a consulting role with different um, domestic and international funding organizations to help them set up topically based competitions and eventually felt position was too broad and I missed Earth System Science and found my way back to NOAA and this position. So what else can I talk? Oh, so I, I think an important difference between NOAA and NSF is NOAA is a mission-based agency. And so the, the research questions that NOAA solicits, um, it's not necessarily blue sky research. It's research that's targeted towards a specific question that's relevant to NOAA's mission. And so if you look at the competition information sheets for each program, they're um, usually specific to a, to a problem set. And so for COM, we most recently focused on NOAA's precipitation prediction grand challenge. Um, and COM focuses on data set development and analysis using observations and working to integrate those observations into modeling or monitoring use cases. Other programs um, focused on, trying to remember, um, so ERB, AC4, and CVP worked collaboratively to have a call on uh, looking at aerosols and satellite applications for aerosol research. MAP held competitions focused on um, drought and um, using uh, sphere and sphere projections. And so the, the competitions are, are quite topically targeted and they um, change each year. And so just because you submit a proposal um, this year doesn't mean you will be able to submit it to our program in the next year because we might not have a competition that's relevant to that proposal. And so I think that is a, a big difference between submitting proposals to NOAA versus submitting proposals to NSF. In terms of timelines, our timeline usually um, stays the same from year to year. So we release a call for proposals, which includes the NOFO and many competition information sheets within that NOFO um, in July-ish. And so this can vary from June to August, it's usually July. 
We have a 30 day letter of intent period. Um, and so you can submit your letters of intent over this time and then program managers return your letters of intent and program response four weeks after um, the letters of intent are due. And then proposals are typically due in October or November, depending on the year. And then we review those proposals between December and March. And then we try to get program responses back in April. But a lot of the time, our response times depend on um, congressional and agency specific appropriations. And so we do not get back to um, applicants until we have our own program budgets. And so I think I've covered um, timeline, deliverables. Again, the deliverables are specified in the competition information sheet. Um, and like, like NSF, we do grant automatic one year no cost extensions. And so they don't even need to be reviewed. You get them automatically. Um, programs typically fund two to three year projects. Um, in some cases, like if it's a climate process team project, the project may go on beyond three years. Um, in some cases, longer term projects that might be five year projects are reviewed halfway through to, to determine your progress and whether you'll receive additional funding for the last two years. Um, I, I think that's all pretty typical. Are there other things that you wanted me to comment on in my introduction? Jenny, that was great. I think you covered a, a lot of it. And I think, um, I think, yeah, your explanations were really clear of all the different programs. And I also wanted to tell everyone that I shared uh, a resource that Jenny uh, shared with us um, that you can look at that she put together where you can look at the different programs she was talking about and the timelines and other resources that might be useful for you if you're thinking of submitting a grant a grant proposal to NOAA. Oh, uh, oh I, I, I did want to mention um, one mm -hmm. thing. How, how do you hear about our, our funding programs and our funding solicitations? Um, each program has a, has a website and each program office has a website. And so we have a funding opportunities page that has all of this information posted on it. It's also posted on grants.gov. And we also have a list serve. If you want to join our list serve, we send out two emails um, and one of two emails a year. And one of those emails um, is about our funding opportunity. Um, and so in addition, so we have these annual funding opportunities. In this administration, we've also received pots of money through um, these one-off legislation um, packages. And so that includes the Inflation Reduction Act, the infrastructure bill, um, and supplemental bills that come with the um, omnibus budget. And so through those, you may see additional competitions that um, are tied to authorizing congressional language. And so I would say um, in years where we have an administration that is eager to fund climate research, keep an eye on um, funding agency websites because you may see competitions come out that are not tied to the annual regular competition topics. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks for the, um, the additional information about how to um, access or to see all the calls for funding through NOAA. Um, that was really great. And um, so we're going to jump into the slide of questions. We had some like preset questions, but I think you guys have covered those already. So we'll jump into the slide of questions because there's a lot of them and um, some really good ones. So. Um, so yeah, um, do you want me to ask or? I, I can ask. Yeah, okay, I've done sorry. a lot of talking. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, I've shared this too, so everyone can see it online without having to toggle back and forth. So I'll just go in order of which ones have the most likes. Um, so the first question is, are there differences in how NSF and NOAA handle review 
and award proposals which focus on other geographic regions, for example, um, Africa and Asia. So Eric or Jenny, do you have a response to that question? I can talk Eric. about how how NOAA program, how NOAA Climate Program Office, um, NOAA Climate Program Office programs approach this. It varies based on the program and the competition. So I would encourage you to contact the competition manager or the program manager and ask if your focus area is relevant to the call. And so in some competitions like AC4 sometimes funds global focused research um, as does CVP, um, but other programs or competitions may not be interested in focusing on specific areas. Uh so I guess my answer to that, um, you know, we're doing basic science research, and so we tend to be focused on, uh, you know, the phenomenon. So, you know, granted, no one actually lives in the eastern equatorial Pacific too much, except for, you know, there's a small number of islands, of course, but, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of money is spent on looking at conditions in eastern equatorial Pacific because that's where El Nino lives. Um, you know, uh, lately there's been tremendous interest in uh, the Amazon, the idea that the Amazon is a green ocean. Um, you know, so we receive proposals on that. And to the extent that people can make the case uh, that there is something special going on in the Amazon in terms of the fundamental climate dynamics, that the clouds look different there and the circulation patterns and the way that the rainy season unfolds, um, you know, has some dynamical mechanisms that ought to be explored, um, then, you know, we end up funding research on the Amazon. And then other people come and say, gee, you're putting all your money on the Amazon, and how come it's not going to the Congo? Uh, and the answer is, well, we got a lot of proposals on the Amazon. You know, it wasn't our choice that we prefer um, one rainforest to another. Uh, and lately, you know, we actually did fund a proposal on the Congo where the argument in the proposal was, hey, you know, everybody thinks that the Amazon is the quintessential prototypical rainforest, but actually if you look at the Congo, things are pretty different there. And if, you're, if your mental conceptual image of a rainforest is entirely determined by that one place, then you're missing out on a lot of things that can happen in that context. You know, um, so that I think would give you a flavor of how at least my program kind of considers these things. It's not about, you know, if you say, well, you know, I want to study the 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 um, the eastern United States, you know, then the question is, well, you know, why? What phenomenon are you, you know, are, are you looking to address? What scientific questions are, are you posing? You know, and if the answer is, well, I want to study this place because a lot of people live there, um, you know, that may not be the winning argument for why the proposal should be funded. But that said, you know, when I say winning argument, what I mean is, you know, we tend to fund proposals because they reviewed well. You know? and, and when I send out the proposal to review, I'm sending out that proposal to people who have expertise really in um, climate dynamics, you know, by one or another definition. You know, and so it's all about that question of, you know, why do you want to study this region? You know, why is it of scientific interest? And if you can answer that question, then I think that's fine. Now, I am speaking from my own perspective and from the perspective of my program. So, you know, please understand, other things happen at NSF. So, for example, we have these solicitations, which are not core programs. They don't exist typically for more than, say, three to five years. Um, but right now we have one that's called Coasts and People, right? And so... If you submit a proposal to the coasts and people solicitation, then yeah, I think it's going to be understood that I'm submitting a proposal about a coastal region because it says coasts and people, you know. Um, and so, you know, to really understand how, you know, uh, regionality is, is, is understood in those solicitations, you know, you would go online and read the solicitation. I'll mention one other thing, which is that um, when people really want to study a region, when they want to do place-based research, um, a lot of that comes under the under the category of um, um, what's that called? G uh, uh, geography, right? So there are geography programs, and for example, you know, a geography program might receive a proposal um, to you know look at rainfall in Uganda because it has to do with farming practices in Uganda. You know, and so there was a proposal like that, and the CLB program co-funded because we can. That's the thing we can talk about uh, how things get co-funded at NSF. Um, 
but they are interested in understanding what goes on in Uganda. You know, they are interested in understanding research, which is which is which is necessarily regional. Um, you know, in a way that you would not if your fundamental sort of program goal was to improve, you know, basic science understanding of climate dynamics. So I hope that answers the question. I mean, I mean maybe I'm um, maybe I'm off mark, but but I'm happy to follow up on that. Yeah, that was really great, uh, Eric and Jenny. Very thorough. So thank you for that. Um, the next question, and then maybe after we do this slide of question, we can take questions from the audience in person because I'm sure there's someone there. Um, so the next question is, how are interdisciplinary submissions handled, ones that come under the purview of different divisions in NSF or NOAA? Oh, I don't know. Jenny, do you want to you go first on that? No. Nope. Okay. <laughs> so I will tell you um, my experience, and, and um, here goes. Uh, if I get a proposal, um, and this happens, so it's a climate program. Climate connects to virtually everything, right? And so I get a proposal, and the proposal is, well, you know, we want to understand how, you know, uh, the land surface affects climate in one way or another. So this could be vegetation, for example. So, gee, what do I do? You know, well, um, I take that proposal and I say, you know, I write emails to everybody I can think of who might be interested in uh, funding vegetation work because we don't actually, we're not a program for biology, right? Um, and, you know, because it's a land surface, uh, the land component of the hydrological science lives in a program called hydrological sciences, and it's part of the solid earth division uh, within the geosciences directorate. Um, and so I send, I send an email saying, hey, you know, could you take a look at this and see if you'd be willing to co-review the program, the proposal and co-fund it? You know, and if I'm lucky, then, you know, the hydrological sciences program comes back and says, yeah, well, you know, we're very interested in evapotranspiration, so we want a piece of that, you know, so we'll, you know, commit to um, funding, you know, 25, 30, 50 percent of the, of the cost of this uh, if it reviews well, and we will take it to our review panel, right? Um, and, and then that happens, you know, and so I guess one of the things to be aware of there is that the hydrological sciences program has a deadline and my program does not, you know, and so how long it takes to review that proposal, what's a good time to submit the proposal, those are questions that now become actually serious questions because there's a deadline, you know, which there wouldn't be if it just came to me. And so, you know, if you're working on a topic where you can sort of see how more than one program might be interested in this in this topic and you don't know where to send it, you have to send an email to the program directors of the programs. You know, you can just send a you can just send the email to me because then I will probably know who else to send that that to, who else to ping within NSF. But you can contact the other program directors directly as well. Um, you know, and then you know if 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 the deadline for proposals in hydrological science is you know I'm making this up if it's in October, you know you have to imagine that their panel is not going to convene until a couple of months after that, and they're not going to make funding decisions until maybe another month after that. You know, and so. If the proposal has to go to that panel, you know, then you could submit it to my program earlier than that. But the review process probably isn't going to conclude until that panel has done its thing, you know. And so there are these kind of timeline issues that come up when you do that. Another conversation, which I think is a longer conversation, is you know how does this kind of co-review affect the chances of success, um, you know, and how easy is it for programs within NSF to co-review stuff, and the simple answer that I would give is it sort of, it sort of depends on how much sort of intellectual distance there is between programs. You know, so uh, we co-review proposals all the time with hydrological sciences. It's it's not that far away from us intellectually. A program that we co-review co 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 and co-fund with a lot more is oceanography, because obviously the ocean is part of climate. Right, um, physical and dynamic meteorology. You know, there's, there's a weather climate interface, and so we're constantly co-reviewing proposals um, from one and between those two programs that sit on either side of the weather climate interface. Um, and so that kind of co-review is a lot easier um, than if you're really going and trying to sort of, you know, bridge an interdisciplinary gap that's much greater in terms of, you know, how much you know intellectual territory you're trying to span. Um, so that's that's my short answer, but we can have a longer answer if you want to follow up on that. And I think if you really have ideas, specific ideas about 
you know, disciplines that you'd like to merge, then yeah, I think we need to talk specifically to those, you know, to which disciplines you're, you're, you're referring to. Summer, do you have a question you want to ask? Yeah, um, so I asked that question um, and I do have a follow up on that because we submitted a proposal which went to three different divisions and we ended up getting 11 reviewers and there were too many opinions mm -hmm. and it did end up getting rejected. So I thought that maybe it's a bad idea to have these interdisciplinary uh, proposals in the end because there's just too many opinions and you cannot impress 11 or 12 reviewers. And that's why I asked that question, how do you handle them? Because these are just too many um, feedback. Yeah, I mean, I guess the question, the problem with your question is that I can only really tell you how how I handle them. Um, and I guess, you know, one of the things that I think I've always kind of understood in my own mind is that stuff that I care about is not necessarily stuff that other people care about. You know, so for example, if you're a hydrological, hydrological sciences is very much kind of stream flow watershed type orientation, you know, it's, it's, it's largely done in civil engineering programs. Uh, the field, I think, kind of grew out of questions of, you know, how much rain does it take to cause a flood of a certain magnitude on a creek, you know, essentially things like will my basement flood kind of questions, you know, and when you look at the kinds of things that people do when they're hydrological sciences, they, they put on a big tall pair of rubber boots and they wade in a stream and with a big yardstick and measure stream flow. You know, they do things, and my point is that that's a very small spatial scale compared to climate, right? Often what we care about is, you know, land atmosphere coupling taking place over rather vast stretches, over a chunk of the continental United States. And because we tend to be interested in large scales and they tend to be interested in small scales, a thing that would review reasonably well in my program would not be of tremendous interest to their program. And then the question is, well, what do you do, right? And my, my, my sort of, you know, um, expectation is that, well, if, if this looks like something that's going to be of interest to the climate dynamics community, I want to fund it. I don't care if it's not of tremendous interest to the hydrological science pro sciences program, because my fundamental question is, is this research going to do something important for climate science? You know, and uh, the thing about vegetation on land surface is that, you know, I don't really want to be a program about biology, but I fully recognize that you can't do climate without considering vegetation. It does, it's one of the things you have to get involved in, you know, like it or not. Um, and so the question is, you know, to what extent does a program have the ability to just say, well, you know, I'm going to fund this, you know, because it's of interest to my program, even if it's not of interest to other programs. And I think, you know, the willingness of programs to do that, but not just the willingness, but really the ability of programs to do that. It depends so much on, you know, what else is in their queue, you know, uh, how, you know, how important is this, is this work perceived? Um, you know, in terms of the kinds of science that they're trying to fund. And, and those are hard questions. I mean, I don't think there's any really easy answer. Um, but yeah, I know what you're saying. You're saying, well, if, if, in every pro in if, if in every program my funding chance is one in three, then if I take it to three different programs and my funding chance is one three to the power of three, you know, and why would anyone bother doing that? Um, and so I, I agree that's a hard question. And I think the only, you know, uh, the only consideration is that it doesn't have to be like that. You know, uh, I think the question is, you know, is there a program that would see value in your work, even if it wasn't of value to the other players? Um, and I, I, that's that's probably not the best answer in the world. So maybe we could, you could do a follow up on that if you want. And, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Jenny. I was just going to ask you for your input. So go for it. Oh, and I, I, I thought it was best that Eric answer this first, because I think it's more relevant to NSF. Um, so when NOAA Climate Program Office programs want to solicit interdisciplinary proposals, we design the competition that way to ask more cross-program questions. Um, so COM and CVP held a competition together in 21. COM and AC4 held a competition together in 21. And then um, COM MAP and the Climate Societal, Societal and Interactions Division, which focuses more on social science and adaptation science, held a competition together. Um, and that panel was, that reviewing those proposals was challenging because you're crossing 
multiple disciplines kind of beyond the physical sciences. Um, so I, I think even, even when you design a competition to be interdisciplinary, um, review of proposals is, is difficult. But um, I, I would say that it's very, very, very rare for Climate Program Office programs to co-fund proposals unless it's decided on ahead of time. And a, a lot of that is because of program planning and program budgets and what we have anticipated for our programs um, moving, kind of looking out for the next two or three years. Yeah, if I could just follow on, I mean, I, you know, what Jenny is saying, there is a flavor of that at, at NSF, which is that, you know, we do have these um, sort of solicitations, uh, you know, for example, I mentioned coasts and people, you know, if it's called coasts and people, you would expect that to be somewhat interdisciplinary. Um, we had one um, on extreme events that was called pre-events, uh, you know, that was sort of interdisciplinary, I think, within the geosciences. Um, you know, uh, so you will find um, that, uh, you know, within this, the, the world of kind of, you know, um, solicitations uh, uh, that, that are beyond the core programs, uh, there are opportunities for doing interdisciplinary science. But I think as, you know, as Jenny points out, those all have some kind of focus to them. And so the question is, is one of these um, kind of, you know, solicitations of, of, of a particular year, um, going to align with your particular research interests you know the, there was one called food energy water systems for instance you know um, um you know so they they were looking for things that involved economics and uh energy and also um food you know so so if if that happens to align with your research interests and then, then those become opportunities for you uh, and so that is a you know it's a little bit of a kind of fact finding you know exercise to to, to know if there's something like that going on Awesome. Thanks, Eric and Ginny, for the really thorough response there. It's super helpful. Um, I do want to take a moment to see if anyone in the room has any questions that weren't asked on Slido. Margaret, yes. Um, so I've been a little bit unclear as to whether NCAR scientists can submit proposals to NSF, like, like for soft money. Um, and maybe just more broadly, you could both address what kinds of institutions are eligible to submit. Um, proposals to your agencies? Well, I guess since NSF kind of features in the question, I'll I'll start and, and, and <laughs> um, you know, so there's, and, and I actually, I, you know, Valerie Koch is the right person to sort of, you know, answer this, I think, and, and I'll defer to her. But, you know, the basic idea, as I understand it, is that um, the Atmospheric and Geospace Sciences Division, um, you know, funds provides the base funding for NCAR, you know, and I would say it's what, something like 40% of the money in the division goes to NCAR, something like that. Um, so the understanding is that the rest of the money in the division um, does not go to NCAR, it goes to, you know, um, people in academia, um, largely. I mean, this, this no, that's not necessarily a rule. Um, nor is it necessarily a rule that you cannot submit a proposal to the core programs. It's just that, you know, the ha that has to be kind of the, the core program has to agree to it, you know, and so we can have a longer conversation about how that works. Um, but that's specific to the atmospheric and geospace sciences division because, you know, we provide the base funding for NCAR. So as I understand it, there really aren't restrictions against NCAR applying for other, to other programs around the foundation. I, I'm not aware that there's a problem with people that NCAR are submitting proposals to the physical oceanography program, for instance, and maybe Valerie can correct me on that. Um, what we see, I think, a fair amount of is people at NCAR, uh, researchers at NCAR submitting proposals to various solicitations. For instance, um, um, you know, uh, uh, when we did the pre-events uh, um, solicitation, I believe there were people uh, submitting proposals from NCAR. EarthCube, you know, uh, the, the cyber infrastructure um, kinds of, 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 of calls um, I think you often see people at NCAR submitting because NCAR does a lot of cyber infrastructure stuff. Um, there's one in particular, um, um, the acronym is CSSI, and I can never remember what it stands for, um, but CSSI funds, you know, various kinds of work involving um, cyber infrastructure for, uh, 
you know, processing data, for hosting data, for, you know, model development kinds of things, uh, that sort of thing. Um, um, if I remember right, there was a proposal that when that came from NCAR where they wanted to sort of, you know, develop software for um, dealing with model data that's on irregular grids. You know, well, how do I take a zonal average if it's on an irregular grid, stuff like that. Um, you know, and so I think if you if you look at, you know, where proposals from people at NCAR are being funded, I think you would find that kind of thing going on. Um, and again, I'm, I would I would guess that if you went and looked at the awards, if you used, did an award search, uh, you would be able, you know, just there is a way to figure out, you know, give me a list of the proposals that NCAR, is, that NSF is currently funding, um, um, the grants that NSF is currently making through these programs. And the Climate Program Office funds NCAR scientists. Um, there's no restriction. Some, something I did want to mention is that in our notice of funding opportunity, there's the review criteria and the review process. And then at the bottom, there's also this extra section that's called selection factors. Um, and so CPO can select from those fa factors proposals out of rank order um, for whatever reason. And so one of those selection factors is partners. And so some competitions may encourage or even require that proposals include um, a NOAA partner. And so that could be a NOAA lab or a NOAA cooperative institute. They'll typically, the competition information sheet will, will describe what that actually means um, in that context. Um, and in addition to kind of we can fund it in CAR, we can fund um, federal scientists can lead proposals, but we cannot fund federal salaries. Um, we can give money to other federal entities, but it has to be spent not on federal salaries. Um, we can also fund foreign institutions. And so right now, COM is funding a collaboration between GFDL and France, uh, an institution in France. And so if you're interested in collaborating internationally and getting your international collaboration money, you can apply to do that through NOAA. Awesome. Thanks, Eric and Jenny. Um, Valerie, I know you're going to be talking about this in two weeks, but mm -hmm. is there anything you wanted to add from the NCAR side of things? Yeah, and we can definitely get get into this further in the um, October 20th session. So um, just a couple things that I'll add on to what Eric said is um, within the NSF PAPG, um, it does state that FFRDCs, which is what NCAR is, it's a federally funded research and development center. Um, typically, they can only submit proposals on a exceptional basis. And so we do tend to reach out to each of the program managers under each of the solicitations to um, inquire whether or not they would consider funding NCAR on a proposal. Also, many of the solicitations that we respond to, um, they're typically only open to nonprofit organizations and universities. And what I tend to see is that um, program managers are open to NCAR participating as a subawardee on a university-led proposal. So that's generally how we um, are eligible. And again, there are um, additional details we can get into later about cooperative, our cooperative agreement requirements um, that we have with the National Science Foundation. So hope that answers um, that question a little bit. Yeah, that was awesome. Thank you. I also just want to make a public service announcement for the Climate Program Office. We heavily discourage subawards and subcontracts submitted to the Climate Program Office. And so we prefer and encourage that um, PIs submitting from multiple institutions submit identical but separate proposals. And this is outlined in the Notice of Funding Opportunity. And this is not something that we can go back and fix after proposals have been submitted and we've awarded, or we want to make um, awards and selections. And so if, if you are submitting to the Climate Program Office, please submit separate but identical proposals instead of including people as sub-awards. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. 
Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit now. I think this is probably a question on everyone's mind is how do you get your first lead PI proposal funded? Um, and how can we show our qualifications as early careers with relatively less experience? Well, I mean, I, you know, Tidbit, as, as I sort of see it, you know, uh, um, oh, Mariana, did you want to, did you want to ask something before I? Yeah, I was, it's the same question, but maybe a slightly different lens. How did uh, you, Eric, or you, Jenny, get your first PI grant proposal funded? So like maybe from the perspective of when you were doing your first uh, grant endeavor, what was it that made it go from you were just co-PIs to now? you are a PI on, on a grant? Well, I mean, I, you know, my impression, you know, is, is that I have a, a pretty normal, you know, unremarkable career through academia. You know, I was a grad student, I wrote a few papers, and then I was a postdoc, and I wrote a couple more. And, you know, I went around and presented my work and, and, and got to know some of the people in the field. So I think the, you know, the expectation is that by the time you submit a proposal, and this was true for me, um, you already have some kind of track record. Um, you know that in a way, it's not really about the proposal, the number of proposals you've written, or the amount of money that you've got. Um, it's it's really about you know building kind of a reputation, you know, based on publications and 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 and, and presentations that sort of advertise that hey, you're here and this is what you do. Um, and you know, I think when when I have, uh, I don't remember that there was anything particularly remarkable about me writing a proposal. I, there was work that I've been doing for a while, and I submitted a proposal. And I think the people that reviewed the proposal, you know, were aware of it, and they also kind of, you know, uh, uh, were able to look at what I'd written in the proposal and sort of infer from that that I sort of, you know, on some level knew what I was talking about. Um, and so, you know, if I talk about sort of translating that into what I see every day when we get proposals, because we commonly get proposals in somebody's first proposal, um, you know, you rely on typically the proposals written on the basis of work that you've already done. You know, so I would see people writing and referring to the to the to the work that they've already done. We found this in you know my paper with so and so from last year, and here's how we're going to follow up on that. Um, the other thing that you do is you you write you you put figures in the proposal that show preliminary results that you've got. You know, if you really want to do, let's say, you know, a giant, you know, model intercomparison project to, you know, look at the effect of, you know, some twiddle of, of cloud microphysics on climate, you know, it's nice to have some little kind of, you know, pilot that says that, you know, it's likely that you'll find something interesting if you actually go through all of that effort. Um, you know, and so I think those kinds of things you can, you know, you can build credibility on that basis uh, without having a demonstrated track record of, of funding. You know, there's when when you review proposals for NSF, you know, I don't really like the way we review proposals because it's too complicated. You know, after comment on broader impacts and intellectual merit, and under each of those things, there are five set subcategories. So it's, it's ten things, right? One of the things that you're asked to comment on is: is this person you know, qualified to do the research, you know, um, almost universally, the answer is yes, right? I mean, if, if, if the deliverable of an NSF proposal is that you write papers and advance science, um, and, you know, by the time you even start writing proposals, you've already been a grad student and a postdoc, then yeah, there's a paper trail that shows that you can write papers. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think the, you know, the question of, well, how do I, show qualifications i think what you're really asking i mean the way i would frame that is how do i establish credibility among the people that are going to review this proposal you know and i think by and large in academia you know they, they call it publish or perish it's not the most friendly way of saying it um but you know you do research as a grad student and as a postdoc and on that basis i think we kind of decide that you can do research as a funded pmi so I hope that answers the question. I mean, I don't mean to sort of, you know, um, you know, gloss over this because I know it's an important issue. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. 
I I would just add that in in my experience of sitting on panels, I I don't think that um, qualifications has been the issue for early PIs, early career PIs. I think it's been experience proposal writing and being able to write a clear proposal with objectives that's responsive to the call that the panelists can kind of understand and review. That's within scope. That's not under or over budgeted or too ambitious. And so I think it's more about experience writing proposals than it is about their scientific qualifications as a, as a PI. That's an excellent point. Yeah, that's, that's a really great point. Um, you know, if you're, I mean, the, the thing is, it's that doesn't just apply to the first time you, you write a proposal. I mean, I see people who are well advanced into their careers and they're still not especially good at it. You know, um, you see people writing proposals where they've tried to use up every single, you know, square millimeter of, of white space on the page. You're just, just cramming that 15 pages with everything in it. You know, be a little kind to the reviewers. You know, I mean, people people have to actually read that and 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 comment intelligently. You know, and synthesize what you've written um, in a way that I can read it and then make a funding recommendation on it. You know, um, and and I think that that business of being able to write clearly, being being able to sort of, you know, give the reviewers kind of confidence that yeah, you know, you're comfortable doing this. You you know, you've thought about the problem. You have a very kind of you know um, well-developed sense of of you know what to do next and how to advance the science here. You know what's the novelty of what you're doing. Um, you know all of those I think comments. I, in my mind, they apply the, the 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 talent and skill of writing a proposal really shouldn't be that different from the talent and skill uh, of writing a science paper. I mean, you, you write a paper, you put it in a journal. What's the guarantee that anyone's going to read it? You know, and you find that. You know, when people are good at writing papers, you know, when they write clearly and they're good at kind of organizing their thoughts, um, they get more citations. You know, I, I think that's kind of how, I don't think the rules there are really any different for proposal writing than they are for, for paper writing. And, and we at the Climate Program Office are always looking for new faces for panelists. And so if you're interested <laughs> in getting experience reading proposals, Check out the Climate Program Office programs if you have not submitted a proposal. If there's one that fits your area of expertise, don't be afraid to reach out to the program manager. Tell them who you are. Tell them what you can do for them. Yeah, you know, there's a question here, I think, there was a question in the chat about, you know, can you see more than just uh, the abstract and the title of the proposal? Um, the answer for me is no, I'm not actually allowed to, you know, show you somebody else's proposal that they submitted to the to the program. I mean, there's certain confidentiality issues here. Um, that said, you know, you could go and ask somebody, you know, for a copy of a proposal they've written. It wouldn't be, a, you know, a stranger, of course. It would likely be, you know, your own thesis advisor, um, but it could be, a you know, a colleague that, that you know well enough um, to ask for that. Um, and the other way that people see what a proposal looks like um, is they get one to review, you know, and you can send me an email if you want to review proposals. We have a stack of them. If there are some that sort of meet your particular area of expertise, then we can send a proposal to you to review. Um, a fun thing to do if you review a proposal is that then go later on to the NSF awards page and see if it got funded, you know. Um, if you thought it was a good proposal and it didn't get funded, then that's kind of interesting. Um, if you thought it was a bad proposal and it got funded anyway, then that's kind of interesting. I mean, those <laughs> those are games that you can play, you know. Um, and I think all of that, um, you know, is perhaps helpful in terms of you know understanding, uh, you know, what a proposal looks like and what what are sort of the standards in the field. Can I add a follow up to this? Do you think it's like I appreciate that? There are good tactics for writing grants, like showing preliminary results is across all age ranges. There's no early career specific advice. Like, don't take on too much right away. Make sure you have a senior mentor, anything like that that people look for. Like, just as social scientists, I know there might be not official rules, but there's biases we all have, right? So you look at someone proposing to do $17 million and there's no one else in their discipline as their first grant, that's not gonna go over as well. Like, maybe it's you get something small and then you do something big. Is there any internal wisdom on that? Well, like, yeah. Early career. <laughs> It's actually going to work better if you just 
if, if you just bug me and you know with different questions because you're thinking of questions that I hadn't thought of. Um, yeah, absolutely. Don't your first proposal to NSF should not be to direct a science and technology center for fifty million dollars. <laughs> uh, when you look at you know go to the NSF awards page and you'll see that most of what we fund is these three year projects and basically you know it's maybe something like a half million dollar budget and I don't think the dollar amount really doesn't matter that much. It's what are you getting for that for that for that dollar, right? I mean, typically you know on, on that level, what we're funding is we're funding. A professor, you know, um, maybe an assistant professor if it's early career, uh, and that person is getting at one or two months of summer salary, and then on top of that, let's say there's a graduate student or a postdoc. So we're thinking about, you know, what's a re what's a reasonable amount of science for you to propose that's going to take you three years and is going to involve you and you know one or two months of your time, which you know it's kind of in quotes because I don't know that that's really how these things are done. It's not like you just don't focus on that at all until that one month. Um, and then, you know, there's going to be this grad student and that's going to be, you know, kind of an issue because while the grad student doesn't know anything coming in, maybe they don't even know how to write code or whatever sort of, you know, technical thing you need them to do. And so that's some effort that's required. Um, or you could say, well, I need a postdoc because really at this stage I'm too busy spinning up courses and things like that. And I need somebody who's going to really be able to jump in, you know, hit the ground running. Um, you know, and then you would think, well, okay. Uh, you know, how much can I really expect to accomplish, you know, and then uh, is it going to be something of interest, you know, if I if I do that much work. Um, so yeah, I think it's, it, it does, you know, there are bigger projects where, you know, I think we would look for experience. If, if you want to direct a big project, then we are going to look and see if you've ever directed a littler project. That makes sense. If it's field work, you know, if you want to go to the field, then, you know, have you or have you not ever, I don't know, done the kinds of things people do in, in, in the field, you know, uh, flown on an aircraft, you know, minding an instrument or something like that, you know, that kind of stuff would then count. Um, but I, you know, I, I, I don't know if that gets entirely at your question. Yeah, I think it, it, it's closer to the early career stage of how to plan that, which is helpful. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I, you know, one of the questions you could ask, I think, you know, and, and I don't, I don't know that there is an answer, a specific answer to this question is, you know, should you should you be a write a proposal on your own or should you be part of a big group effort you know um and and that involves some considerations i mean i think the funding rate in my program for you know single pi proposals is probably greater than the funding rate for solicitations where they're asking for big proposals that have you know half a dozen co-pis on them or something like that you know that said it might take you less time to participate in one of those things because there's a lot of people writing this proposal and it's only 15 pages long. You know, um, a better question for that kind of thing is, okay, you know, how does that look to your chair, to your department chair, or whoever it is going to decide your tenure case? You know, maybe that maybe it looks better in some sense if you've got this, you know, single PI proposal because that way you're demonstrating independence and you know you're building your own sort of reputation and so on and so forth. Um, so that's a thing to think about. You know, uh, so this. You know, there's a big conversation to be had about sort of group science versus more kind of individual project science. And I, I want to add um, for Eric mentioned field campaigns. So the climate program office does fund field campaigns, usually on like a five to seven year time horizon. And the planning for those happens over many, many years and usually involves a number of workshops and a series of solicitations. And so, for instance, the Climate Variability and Predictability Program just funded um, pre-field studies for a potential future field campaign um, in FY22. So those awards should be released in the next few weeks. So as an early career PI that's just started, if you're not aware or involved in kind of those multi-year efforts that have been going on, it may be difficult I'm not discouraging people from applying to future calls, but that's something that you would want to contact the program manager about to understand the history of kind of the funding calls that have built up to a potential field campaign, at least for NOAA's Climate Program Office. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of a career thing, isn't it? You know, when you look at people who do field campaigns, they tend to sort of make a career out of doing field campaigns. And I think that's because it's actually really hard to do that. You know, it's not as if you could just kind of dabble in field campaigning uh, and and that's a longer conversation to have i mean i'm not saying that's necessarily the a, a good thing you know that it works out that way um but you know 
on the topic of establishing credibility, you know, if you're going to propose field work, you know, it's nice if you've done some. I think most people who propose to do field work have done that as a grad student. Um, people who are involved in, in, in field campaigning tend to be part of a community of people who are doing that. You know, and so they would know what's going on uh, at the NCAR Earth Observing Laboratory. You know, they would know um, from, you know, uh, AGU sessions and things like that, you know, what kinds of things. Everybody, you, sh you should be aware of the Eureka campaign. You should be aware of the Socrates field campaign. You should be aware of, you know, I don't know, um, um, well, Thin Ice was one. Um, you know, Stradial 2 is an interesting example. I don't know how many people in the United States are aware of that, but that's a ballooning campaign. You might be aware that the French have a dedicated ballooning division uh, in their version of NASA, and they do, you know, stratospheric balloons over the equator that, that, that you know, stay on, essentially on orbit for two or three months. I mean, um, you know, uh, figuring out what's going on in that world is a thing that, you know, the program manager may be able to help you with, but you know it's a community of people. There are various ways of kind of, you know, gaining an entrance into that world. I think. Great, thank you, Eric and Jenny. That was really helpful. Um, so we're at ten forty-six, and I want to make sure um, there's some time for your for any closing comments that you guys might have. Maybe a couple of minutes each, and then. Um, we can um, wrap it up. Uh, closing comments. Um, <laughs> I mean, you don't have to add anything if you feel like you. Well, said, I mean, said it all. <laughs> I guess I would sort of, you know, go back to this issue that I mentioned, you know, kind of in the beginning that uh, there's a lot of variation uh, within NSF as to, you know, how programs do what they do. I mean, the business of having or not having deadlines. Um, the the business of you know when there's a review process, right? So we're supposed to sort of make uh, funding decisions and 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 award grants um, on the basis of kind of how 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 the community um, perceives what you're doing. Uh, but community is kind of a loaded word, right? I mean. Um, you hear about all different things being called a community, and uh, I guess it—it's sort of, you know, uh, I guess in a way I get to decide who that community is because, you know, I'm saying that your proposal is being reviewed by members of the community, but really, it's all secret who those reviewers are, right? We're not allowed to reveal their identity because that'd be a really bad thing. Um, and so then the question is, well, you know. Uh, if you write a proposal that sort of, you know, you, you, it's a proposal on climate dynamics, um, you know, I'm going to use my knowledge of the climate dynamics community to pick reviewers for that proposal. Um, and I would hope that my understanding of what that community is and, and who's in it uh, is the same as yours. Um, you know, and, so, and I think that by and large works reasonably well. I mean, these things haven't been invented yesterday. Um, um, you know, but I think the, you know, the the fundamental understanding of 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 uh, uh, you know, if you're writing a proposal that's that's going to be reviewed by a particular community of people, what are their expectations? I would hope that you could gain some insight into that just by going to AGU meetings and talking to people, and you know, and I don't just mean AGU meetings; I mean all kinds of meetings, really. Um, that 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 you would be in some sense a part of that community before you before you even submit a proposal. Um, to NSF, um, but again, that gets complicated if you're if you're wanting to work across disciplines, you know, if you're wanting to do things that you know really can't be defined by a discipline in in, in quite so easy a way, you know, and I think that's where you know communication with program managers becomes much more important, you know, uh, really kind of doing everything you can to kind of pave the way for your proposal by helping us understand, you know, what this is. Uh, you know how it ought to be reviewed. Um, you know uh, what you know what our expectations should be, and 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 making sure that we communicate those expectations to you. Um, so maybe that would be the the best sort of NSF specific kind of you know parting words that I could give. Um, so again, you know, thank you for kind of you know listening to me for the last hour or so. Yeah, thanks so much, Eric. That was uh, yeah, all your 
all your advice and expertise, I think has been super helpful for us to understand kind of how the NSF program works and the funding in there. Um, Jenny, do you have any closing thoughts or comments? Um, I'll stay on this thread of community. Um, so the NOAA Climate Program Office competitions, while they are topic specific, they're informed by the science community. And one of the ways um, program managers do that is going to workshops, having these conversations, as well as funding workshops and um, interacting with CLIVAR panels um, and other kind of NOAA-specific fora. So I mentioned NOAA's Precipitation Prediction Grand Challenge. Um, our division also has an ESSM council, which is made up of both NOAA and external community folks. Um, and NOAA also has a climate working group, which is part of their science advisory board, which is made up of um, primarily external people. And so there are lots of ways where, where we either informally or formally get feedback and input from the science community. And so I would say if that is of interest to you, that's one way to get involved. Actually, could I make one more comment? This is, again, very NSF specific. Um, you know, you can come and work at NSF. Uh, I mean, I don't know that, you know, that's, that, that's a whole other conversation, of course, but I'd say, you know, roughly half of the people who process proposals and conduct a review process and do things like that um, are what we call rotators. So the people who um, don't quite work for the federal government, instead they come from academia and they sit with us and, and, and help us run the programs. Uh, and typically they're here for, you know, three to two, three, four years, something like that. Um, the reason I said it's a longer conversation is it's not really clear um, that this is the thing that you want to do at the very start of your career, um, you know, but it's it's something to keep in mind that, you know, we do, you know, I'm the only permanent program manager in, in my program. I can't really run the program myself. It's too big. And so right now, Varlin Pasavan is in the program. He's from Coastal Carolina University. Um, you know, but before him, it was Ming Kai from FSU. Um, before that, other people have have done this 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 function. Um, so it is something to keep in mind. I mean, you would you would of course learn a lot about proposals and you know who's doing what across a wide variety of of, of science, and you know would also be a way of understanding what goes on in the government. Great. Um... Cool. Um, thanks so much, Jenny and Eric. I put um, Eric's and Jenny's um, contact information there. I hope that's okay. Um, that's it was public, so I figured it would be okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we did record this session, so um, all the participants, and I believe just the early career scientists and postdoc lists will um, will get an email about the video, so you can uh, rewatch it. You know. If, if you're out of all of your Netflix shows. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so our next session is going to dive more into some of the um, NCAR specific uh, policies and protocols that we touched upon today. And Valerie will be there too. So save the date for that. Um, it's in two weeks at the same time. Not sure if it's the same place, but it will definitely be hybrid and you'll get more information on that soon. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Ginny and Eric again. We really appreciate your time. This is really valuable information for us um, as we, you know, get into grant writing, proposal writing, and um, yeah, try to have successful academic careers. Thank you. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everyone. See you next time. Bye.